Hello and welcome to the very, very first episode of Perspective right here on the CryptoCast Network. You guys can find us at CryptoCast.network uh, where you'll see our YouTube link, our iTunes link, RSS link, and Twitter link. And of course, uh, we have uh, our... Um, our, our store up there, our merch store, where you guys can check out our t-shirts with the CryptoCast logos and the One Vortex logos. And of course, uh, this channel is supported by uh, viewers and listeners like yourselves. Uh, we are displaying the QR code and uh, the donation address. If you guys want to uh, throw us a tip, we really appreciate it. We've gotten a couple more in the past few days and uh, yeah, we're having a great time and we hope you guys are too. And if you could uh, and if you guys could, we really, really would appreciate if you could give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you guys are new. And please give us, please uh, give us a review in the iTunes store. That really helps us out and gets uh, more people onto the channel. And of course, we are still doing our programming with Bitcoin.com workshop, which is an interactive two-day uh, developer workshop that we're going to teach uh, C Sharp developers about Bitcoin and how to use the N Bitcoin library to begin integrating Bitcoin into their applications. And that will be taught by both myself and the creator of the N Bitcoin library. Uh, Nicola Doye, and uh, we'll be traveling all around the country right now where we got scheduled for uh, Las Vegas on September 1st, uh, San Francisco October 13th, and Seattle November 3rd, and uh, should be a great time. We got we got some a bunch of registrations already, and uh, we're really, really excited. And of course, we only accept uh, Bitcoin <laughs> uh, for, for this, and um, that is being uh, accepted uh, with the use of the tool called BTC Pay Server, which allows anybody to become their own merchant processor, completely open source, and uh, a really great uh, addition to, uh, to to anybody's developer stack, and again created by uh, Nicola Doye, and we will even, of course, teach you guys about this uh, in the course. So, without further ado, let's get let's stop screen sharing and get right into the show today, ladies and gentlemen. Where we will be talking to John Newbury. Uh, let's see, let's see if I can do my English accent. John Newbury. Let's see if that uh, maybe that might <laughs> sound a little bit more right. Uh, John, back, thanks, <laughs> thanks so much for for joining, man. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, how are you doing today, John? <laughs> yeah, good to be here. I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Oh, really, really good. I uh, really, really appreciate you coming on the show. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, not a whole lot of time, so I want to get right to it. There's a um, there's a whole lot of things we want to go over. So first, uh, let me let me just uh, say, John, you know. You, you and a number of other people, uh, another uh, um, a number of other colleagues have started this new Bitcoin Optech newsletter and uh, this new startup. And uh, I, I think that uh, I, not enough people know about this yet. Now, this is this is new. I know this is uh, new for you guys, but still, I don't think enough people know about this yet. And so I wanted to uh, do a show with you, John, so you can maybe explain a little bit more about this. And maybe we can even explain uh, why this is so important for the community. So, John, uh, if you could just walk us through maybe just a little bit about yourself and and how um, this this Bitcoin Optech newsletter got started? Sure. Um, so I, I work at Trinkoda Labs in New York, and I spend most of my time working on Bitcoin Core. I've been here for about eighteen months, two years, working on Bitcoin Core. Um, but whilst I'm here at Chaincode, we have quite a bit of freedom to work on other projects that we think are important for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, Chaincode is non-commercial. We, we don't have customers or revenue. We, we, we're not trying to get a profit. Um, we exist for basically research and development in Bitcoin and, and trying to strengthen Bitcoin in, in whatever way we can. So one project that I've been working on um, for the last few months is Bitcoin Optech, which I started earlier this year. And the history of this project is uh, we saw towards the end of last year, November, December, coming into January, we saw fees spike up massively. Um, as we got a lot more traffic on the Bitcoin network, um, a lot more transactions going through and the mempool filling up and consequently transaction fees going through the roof. At the same time as that, there were user, users of the Bitcoin network who were not um, adopting the best practices for scaling technologies and scaling techniques. Things like SegWit usage, things like batching, transaction batching, uh, UTXO consolidation, change avoidance, those things that we know about and we know are, are good for individual users of the system and good for the system as a whole. Um, so we saw that towards the end of last year, there's qu quite a bit of frustration, I think, from members of the Bitcoin community, if you want to call them that, um, that some of the large high frequency users of the Bitcoin network, so exchanges and custodians, and payment processors were not adopting these technologies. And Adam Back sent a, a post to a mailing list that I'm on, um, kind of laying out 
a rough vision for a project to try and help these companies or persuade these companies to adopt scaling technologies. Um, fast forward a few months and Optech is, is what came out of that. I, I was very interested in the project. Um, my colleague here at Chainco, James, and um, Steve on the West Coast um, were also interested and, and we thought this was a good idea. We thought maybe we could do something to help. So we put together Optech, we've been talking to companies and our goal is to help and encourage those companies to adopt scaling practices. So like I said, things like SegWit, um, coin selection, fee estimation, all of those things that can make a marginal diff difference. Um, so if we see if we see an increase in traffic on the Bitcoin network again, like we saw at the end of last year, those companies would be better prepared for that increase in traffic. They would be more efficient with their block usage or, or block, block space usage, um, which is good for them because it lowers their fees and good for everyone else because then there's more space for all of us. So it's kind of marginal things at the moment. Um, we're not talking about orders of magnitude scaling, um, but they're, they're all good things for the health of the network. And I think longer term, if we th see things like lightning take off, that would be like the next step in terms of um, scaling Bitcoin. So concretely, Optech is doing things like meeting with companies, trying to understand their pain points and, and reasons why perhaps they haven't adopted these technologies. We've run a few workshops. Well, we've run one workshop and we have another one coming up. And we, we intend to continue doing that. And one other thing that we're doing is we have a technical newsletter, a weekly newsletter that we're using to disseminate technical knowledge from the from the week out to engineers at these companies. But that newsletter is freely available to everyone. So anyone can sign up. Um, we have now, I think, a thousand subscribers um, since launching a few weeks ago. Very, very cool. Uh, well, thank you, John, for that description. And, you know, uh, I think if the viewers were paying attention, they could really see just how important this could possibly be. So just a, just a quick recap, you know, we did have some issues last year with fees, right? And it wasn't entirely Bitcoin's fault. It was how you it was how uh, businesses and companies were using Bitcoin and, of course, some misplaced expectations. Right. So um, this is, uh, I think, very, very important because, the, I, you know, the developers, I don't think there was quite enough developer outreach last year. I mean, it was definitely, you know, towards the middle and towards the end of the year starting to get better. You know, we had people like Eric, Eric Lombroso start going on various podcasts and things like that. So there was some level uh, of, uh, of education there. But this to me is the next step. This represents the next level, the next step of the ecosystem, uh, people stepping up to to help others and uh, for the benefit of the whole. Because remember, you know, Bitcoin is decentralized, right? It is the only decentralized currency at scale right now. And so people have to step up. This is always a grassroots uh, organization from the from the beginning, from, from the bottom to the top. We always start like this. So, um, you know, um, uh, Different types of uh, different types of initiatives uh, like this get driven from very passionate people, not uh, not for profit. Usually, it's always for passion because again, nobody is no. There's no CEO paying anybody. Uh, there's no marketing company to say, "Hey, look, guys, we, we, you know what? Well, we need to we need to get the numbers up. We need to do this, this, and that." Right. So, uh, you know, I, I see this as an effort from you know from from the Bitcoin community uh, with members like yourself to be able to better help Bitcoin evolve, grow, and scale. And again, just. Guys, th th these are real developers here. These are real people. These are real members of the ecosystem telling people best practices, to, you know, educating people how to use Bitcoin because this is some complicated technology. Again, you know, as many of you viewers, of, of my viewers, uh, I'm sure are aware, this is the crossroads of, of game theory and computer science and economics and uh, all of these things. Finance, it, it just, it's just kind of ridiculous when you step back and, you know, take a look at it. You can really go down the rabbit hole forever. But uh, this is, I think, very, very, very important and, again, represents uh, the next step of, of education. What do you what do you think, John? Yeah, um, some of this stuff is complex. Some of it is actually quite simple. Um, you know, Segwit is fairly simple once you get your head around it. In, in terms of what an exchange or a company would need to do to adopt Segwit, it's um, it's it's not rocket science. But for whatever reason, some companies have not yet done that work. Um, and that might be for a number of reasons. It might be business priorities that you know that they're seeing huge user adoption and they're trying to scale their back end to to bring on board those new users, or they're putting out fires somewhere else. Um, it might be that they have some kind of legacy infrastructure 
and they've got technical debt that is preventing them from refactoring and adopting SegWit. So there's a mixture. Yeah, some of it is complex. Um, some of it is not so complex, but for whatever reason, it may be difficult for companies to adopt. And another another big thing, another big factor is UX can sometimes be tricky around these things. Um, so batching, for example, um, is a pretty straightforward technology, I would, I would argue. But the way that that is presented to users could potentially be confusing. Or another example is RBF could potentially be confusing for users. So for those reasons, sometimes companies shy away from these things because they are worried that by adopting RBF or adopting batching, they could confuse their users and get support tickets. Um, I don't think those UX challenges are insurmountable, but they do require some certain amount of consideration. Absolutely agreed there, uh, John. Very, very, uh, very appreciate that explanation. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this, this, there's some of these features in Bitcoin that are just, you know, they just get, they get, there's, they're, 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 they're not com overly complex, but it's the nuance, the nuance of the understanding that counts. The, the, just a little bit, the details, the devil's in the details here when it comes to these types of things. And like you say, RBF, I believe that the, uh, the BCH folks definitely got that out of control a little bit, definitely misunderstood a few things there. Uh, and, you know, and, and even SegWit, again, just so much misunderstanding about how they're saying that, you know, now the signatures don't exist at all. Like they're not there at all. And it's, and of course we know they're still in the block. Uh, you know, so it's, um, this, this type of education I feel is very important because like we say, guys, this stuff is complex and it, it doesn't have to be overly complex. We have people like John here that can, you know, can, can, um, articulate this very well, in my opinion, and, and speak to these features and maybe help you understand a little bit better. And of course, with an English accent, it makes everything everything that much easier to understand. So John, you know, uh, we, we just, we really appreciate it. So let's, let's talk about the newsletter now a little bit. Sure. Uh, uh, so again, so the focus is of course to educate, Let, let's talk about the newsletter. How many, um, how many newsletters have you guys put out? Uh, how often are you putting this out and, and what, what can we expect? What are some of the main things we can expect from this newsletter? I think we're on number nine now or on number nine or 10, um, that went out this morning. They go out every week on Tuesday mornings, and they are mostly written by David Harding with, with minor input from myself and Steve Lee. Um, so if your listeners are not familiar with David Harding, they should get familiar with David Harding. He's written a lot of technical documentation in Bitcoin, including the developer docs at Bitcoin.org um, and various other things. He's a fantastic technical writer, um, the, best in, the best in Bitcoin, as far as I'm concerned. Um, he has a way of distilling complex technical ideas and concepts and distilling them down into very easily understandable um, English pr prose. He's, he's really good at that. And um, we're very lucky that he his vision is aligned with our vision um, in terms of what we're doing. And he volunteered to write these newsletters um, and he's doing a fantastic job. So what's in them? Well, um, I'm sure you're aware that Bitcoin moves incredibly fast in terms of technical um, advances and ideas that are coming up and changes to Bitcoin Core and other projects. And it's really very difficult to keep up with all of those things that are happening. Um, Bitcoin, Core, Bitcoin Core Dev IRC is very active. Um, the Bitcoin Core repo is very active. Bitcoin Dev mailing list is very active. And just to read all of that material is basically a full-time job. It's, it's overwhelming. And David is doing a great job of taking all of that, all of that fire hose of information and distilling it down to something that you can read in five minutes and summarizes all of those um, technical um, items and news and what's going on in a very digestible summary. 
Yes, and that's what that's what we've seen here. We're looking at you know uh, I just screen shared for the, for the viewers some of the newsletters there, and you know we could definitely see uh, the action. We have the latest action items. We have the latest some of uh, the latest commits that are of note that people need to be aware of. Uh, so, I, but I want to emphasize this too that this is not just for developers, right? Like this newsletter is is for anybody that wants anybody in the space that wants to pay attention to what's happening with Bitcoin. And uh, of course, since Bitcoin is a software <laughs> protocol, it's it's software at the end of the day. There will be a lot of technical things and there will be a lot of programming things that have to do with development and uh, that's a that's a big part of it but again uh you guys are even going to go beyond that with some workshops which we'll get into in a second um yep. but maybe you can just kind of tell us uh since you i'm sure you read these john uh, every single <laughs> single one of these they, they're not too long guys just you know i mean they're really not they're really not that long maybe a five, 10 minute read something like that uh depending on how fast you read but uh, uh it, i think i really would just want to emphasize one one big point here is that there is so much information out there that it just becomes all of this noise. And I want to emphasize this point you said, John, about the fire hose, you know, drinking from the fire hose. Guys, if if you just want to drink from the higher the fire hose, it's going to get insane. You're not going to remember what's going on. You're not going to remember what's happening yesterday. Some of these monumental developments, some of these things that can have implications and ripples for years, like something like pay to endpoint, like something that, you know, that we just kind of slip in the newsletter as one of the new things. It's like something like that could have profound changes across the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's very, very, very important uh, to understand that uh, this is not just for developers and that if you drink from the fire hose, you're, you're just going to get wrecked. And so having something all very, very, very uh, organized like this, and, and again, um, highlighting the most important parts of what happened in the ecosystem, it's just, it's just fantastic. And I got to say, it's, it's better to me to read these than, than to ever look at Coindesk. Like you, you almost don't even want to need to look at Coindesk or the, some of these mainstream, these some of these mainstream news articles, because again, that you're just going to get all the FUD. You're going to get all the, the fire hose, the stuff that comes along with being a fire hose, which most of it ends up being FUD, unfortunately, right? Most of it ends up being, because this is how mainstream media operates. That's how they try to get your eyeballs and your attention. And these guys, this is more of like a nonprofit. They're not trying to get your attention. They're not trying to uh, steal your attention or get eyeballs. They are simply trying to inform. And of course, that's what we that's what we like. And that's what we try to do on this channel as well. And we hope that, that you guys learn something. So um, maybe John, you can sort of, uh, since again, like I said, you 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 read these 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 uh, these uh, every week, and maybe you can just sort of share with the audience and myself a, a little bit uh, or some of your favorite items that have come across the newsletters. Because you guys say you have done nine total so far. Maybe just highlight for, for uh, your personal favorite uh, some of the updates just recently uh, that you find pretty interesting. Yeah, um, let me just load them up and have a look right now. So the. The idea behind the newsletter was to complement our overall mission, which is to um, help companies or help users of Bitcoin, high frequency users of Bitcoin, use Bitcoin more efficiently. So the the audience, the target audience, would be um, operational engineers at Bitcoin companies or exchanges or, or whatever. Um, and I, I really love the way that David has taken the news items of the week and put them in a way that is very useful for those people. So the action items at the top of the newsletter are things that if you're working in Bitcoin, if you're an engineer working on the blockchain, these are the things you should be paying attention to this week. Um, so that that first top section of the action, the action items I think are, are great. Um, so this week, the action item was Bitcoin Core 0 0.17 has been branched and there'll be release candidates. So you should start testing that if you use Bitcoin Core in production. Um, another another item that we had this week was um, in this week's IRC meeting, Bitcoin Core Dev IRC meeting, a few of the contributors talked about projects, longer term projects that they're working on. And David's done a really nice summary of, of what those longer term projects are from people like Jonas Schnelli, Peter Wooler, uh, Vladimir, after. Uh, Oh no, John! Did we, did we it's it? nice to have. Okay, sorry. Oh. I thought we lost you there. Uh, keep keep going. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, um, as I was saying, it's nice to have that kind of longer longer term longer view. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I think number seven. No, sorry, number six. We had a contribution from an engineer at one of our member companies, um, Anthony Towns at Zappo, talking about his experience and Zappo's experience consolidating UTXOs, and I think they consolidated something like four million UTXOs. Um, so just a nice little um, real world example of companies and users 
using the Bitcoin blockchain responsibly. So that they had a very large wallet, you know, several million UTXOs, and they clean that up. And that's good for them, and it's good for for Bitcoin as a whole. So it's nice to get um, nice to get contributions from other engineers. Um, in that same newsletter, we had a selected Q and A from Bitcoin Stack Exchange. So David picked out some of his favorite answers from Stack Exchange, and I think that's going to be a monthly feature going forwards. And I think I thought that was really great as well. Um, just some really interesting questions on on Stack Exchange. And then at the end of the newsletters, he has notable commits from the different projects, so Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, um, just kind of a pulse on what's going on in those projects. So I'm a fan. I I, I review these, and I, I'm part of Optech. Um, so naturally, I'd be a bit biased, but just as a reader, I, I'm I'm a big fan of the the work that David's doing here. Absolutely, and just a shout out to David Harding, guys, and you know, and all the people at Bitcoin Optech. It's this is just not the effort of a single person, or even maybe almost like a single company, because this is really uh, p different people across different companies are coming together for the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. And uh, just really, just really can't uh, appreciate that enough. Can't thank you guys enough for that. Uh, that's that's just really great. So maybe you can tell us, um, you know, those are some some interesting updates. And there's like I said, I, I try to tell people there's just so much happening in Bitcoin that I can't keep track of anything else. And when you guys subscribe to this newsletter you will find out why you will find out directly firsthand experience about what i'm talking about about when i say there is just too much going on in bitcoin to pay attention to so check that out guys if you get a chance now uh john let's just talk about a little bit uh, a little bit about some of the workshops that bitcoin optech is doing so we talked about you know the the origins of it you know why why you guys started it talked a little bit about the newsletters that you guys are trying to do and and what is the what are you guys doing on this workshop front what is that about well, that's about face-to-face -face contact with engineers at these companies, which we think is really important. I and mean, we're all online all the time and communicating with each other you know, over IRC or Twitter or Reddit or whatever your your um, channel of choice is. But there's nothing that, in my mind, beats face-to-face -face communication and, and meeting these people. Um, so those workshops are great because we get to meet these people who are doing the work. But we also get to have really kind of in-depth discussions on um, quite meaty technical issues. So the first workshop in San Francisco, we focused on um, replaced by fee and child pays for parents. And those are quite important for high frequency users of Bitcoin, because if your transaction gets stuck or your customer's transaction gets stuck with a low fee and it's in the mempool but isn't getting confirmed, that can be that can be a pretty bad experience for your customers. So they need some way of bumping a transaction to get confirmed in a block. Um, but the way you do that is quite complex. I mean, the, the, the concept of RBF or child pays for parent is not very complex. But like you said earlier, the, the edge cases and the, the nuances can be um, quite difficult to work through in a way that's, that gives a good user experience. So we, we talked about that in one of the sessions. We talked about um, coin selection was another session in, in that workshop. So um, are people using branch and bound and, and what are the implications of different coin selection algorithms and strategies? And then we had another session on just general engagement with the open source community. And the people who came to that, I think really enjoyed it. We got very positive feedback. Um, and it was just nice to, to meet people. You know, you, if you've been around in Bitcoin for a while, You'll hear lots on Twitter about how terrible company X is or how company Y is against Bitcoin. But then when you sit down in a room with those engineers, they're usually on board and they want to do the right thing. It's just they have different business priorities or you know, for whatever reason, they haven't been able to do the things that, that you have wanted them to do already. Um, so that was great. The next one will be in Paris in November. We don't have an exact date yet. and. We expect that one will be more focused on wallets because a lot of wallet companies are in Europe. Um, we're, we're trying to engage with them and, and have a workshop that's more focused around the issues of the, the wallets face. So we're looking forward to that one. It'll be slightly different. And um, hopefully we'll have an update for you after November. So these, these workshops are closed door. Um, we, we talk about things and we don't record them and we don't attribute um, contributions to those workshops by name because we want people to be able to speak freely 
and not be worried that their words are going to be um, pasted onto Twitter or Reddit or whatever afterwards. But the material that comes out of them, the, the uh, outcomes of those discussions will feed into documentation that we are writing at Optech. So we're, we're planning to write a scaling handbook that will document things like RBF or batching or other technologies like that. Um, and those workshops feed into those chapters of the, the scaling cookbook. Very, very awesome. So, uh, so th this is, you know, this is where you can actually go if you uh, are in the industry to actually hear developers speak about some of the latest issues, what what they're working on, and all sorts of that stuff. And I, it's interesting the approach that you guys take. You're saying you're taking more of a, a privacy approach, uh, so that you know you're not going to publish the videos or you know publish the talks or anything like that, so that developers, like you say, can speak freely. And that that's important in my opinion. I I, I love I love transparency as much as anybody else in Bitcoin. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we are working with some crazy software, and we saw people like Corey Fields, you know, the, uh, who just recently fixed that bug in Bitcoin Cash, you know, in BCH, uh, that he had to do that anonymously. Because because this is just the nature of the business. When you're working with networks that are worth billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, right? You have to uh, be discreet sometimes in, in order to uh, have the least amount of fallout. So, so this is really, I think this is great. This is, um, I think this is needed, and I think that there needs to be more of this industry. Really, like you guys are sort of taking the baton, taking the you know the torch yourself uh, upon yourself, which is great. Uh, but uh, I see this as um as the next level, uh, you know, the first step of the next level of Bitcoin uh, education and, and companies the ecosystem coming together for the better of Bitcoin. Because the, the this is what the game theory of Bitcoin does is it aligns everybody's incentives because everybody's got their own agenda. Everybody does. But if some of their incentives, just the right incentives are aligned, right, we can do amazing, amazing things as a species. So uh, very, very, very cool, John. Uh, so uh, let me just ask you this now. Uh, we talked about the workshops. That was great. Uh, you guys are planning to do one in Paris. Uh, that's going to be the next one, hopefully in fall, this fall, you said in November. Uh, so let me ask you the next question. Um, what is the future uh, of, of Bitcoin Optech? So the, the main part of this company, I think, was formed uh, to deal with scaling specifically, because that's kind of the issues. That was the pressing largest uh, issue in our industry right now, uh, or at least when you guys formed this, was definitely scaling. And it still is, is a bit to an extent. Uh, personally, I, I now see privacy as the next sort of big thing in Bitcoin that we need to start uh, becoming focused on increasingly more and more as the Lightning Network becomes more and more figured out and more and more rolled out and, uh, you know, uh, leave, eventually leaves beta state. Uh, what What is some of the things that you think Bitcoin Optech will focus on in the future after scaling? Well, we need to be careful. We don't want to be the Bitcoin Foundation. We don't want to position ourselves as the only place that companies come and talk to. But that's that's not what we're about at all. We're not trying to position ourselves between Bitcoin companies and the open source system. It, that, that's, that's not what we're about. And if we ever went down that route, then we'd be doing something very, very wrong. Um, we exist really to help the companies adopt scaling technologies. Um, that, that's, that's why we exist. And if we're successful in that and there's nothing else for us to do, then we'll, we'll disband and that will be the end of it. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of very interesting scaling technology coming down the road. So Lightning, um, Lightning is getting more mature. It's still kind of immature right now and probably too immature for um, integration into a lot of these companies, like mainline business processes. But that will come, I expect, in the next couple of years. These These businesses should be experimenting with lightning and over the next year integrating it into their products and services and so if bitcoin optech can in some way help there um, whether it's with documentation or workshops or whatever then that's something we'd look at um, schnorr signatures will be another step up um, you know they're conceptually they're quite simple but when you're doing things like threshold signatures maybe there's a bit of consideration around it, how exactly you do that no, John. We might have lost John. Oh, oh sorry, about, sorry, John. One okay. more. If you you froze one more time, so let's just go back. Um, ten, fifteen seconds. Sorry, go ahead. Ten, fifteen seconds. Did you get as far as Schnorr? Was, was I yeah, we got Schnorr you, you, right after Schnorr. Yep. Um, so if we can help with Schnorr rollout, then yeah, that's a, that's definitely a good thing that we could do and it would prove our worth, I guess. Um, I agree with you that privacy is really important. And personally, I, I would love to see better privacy 
in Bitcoin. Um, like I said, I don't want to, we don't want to position ourselves as the only people that companies talk to. So we don't want to sprawl and, and creep our scope out to being everything. Um, privacy is a bit more difficult in terms of engaging companies because they might not have the same um, incentives or the same motivations as other users of the network scale. I mean, scale is pretty easy. It's an easy sell because scale is good for the company and it's good for the network as a whole. I think privacy is, I also think privacy is good for the network as a whole, but companies might be a bit slower to adopt good privacy features. Um, and I don't see it as our place to advocate that companies do that. Um, you know, personally, on a personal level, yes, I, I, I want to see better privacy. I want to, but just because of fungibility, like fungibility is very important and privacy as well on top of that is very important. Um, so I don't see Optech doing that. Um, you know, that might change, but that's not really within our scope. So it so it does still seem like uh, then that privacy or sorry that uh, scale scaling is is your main focus uh, at Optech. Uh, and again, you know there is there's still more work to be done there. But essentially, uh, at this point, I think Lightning is going to be the main solution for 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 the uh, for Bitcoin scaling. Now, again, there's a lot of optimization that we can still do on chain. Uh, so maybe you can um, just kind of go through a couple of little things that we can still do on chain because Schnorr is going to be one of them. Uh, so maybe um, you can just go through a couple of things that, that we can do on chain or maybe some, a couple of things that you're telling companies to do. And then maybe I want to ask you a few questions about Lightning. So uh, go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, so like you say, Lightning or something else like it is the order of magnitude change that we need to scale Bitcoin. Everything else I'm going to talk about now is marginal improvements but those things are still important um, because if you want to have a robust and performant layer two you want to make your layer one as efficient as possible and lightning isn't there yet it's not ready to be the kind of full replacement for using the layer one for payments so until that happens we need to keep going forwards with layer one and, and make layer one as efficient and scalable as possible and there are things we can do right now so things like batching, where if you're making multiple payments over a short period, instead of having one transaction for each of those payments with a change output coming back to you, just have one large transaction with multiple outputs for each of your payments and then one change output to you. So that's a really quite straightforward technology. It might require changes in your infrastructure if you've built your infrastructure to say, have a model where one transaction equates to one payment. but Conceptually, it's pretty simple, and it's it's a really big win in terms of efficiency of chain usage. Other things are SegWit, of course, because if you're using SegWit, you get a, a fee reduction. Basically, you, you get a, a discount in your signature, um, so that's good for you. It's good for other people because there's more space for their transactions in the blockchain. Um, other things are things like coin selection. So when you're when you have a wallet, your wallet contains a big bag of UTXOs, we call those coins. And when you make a spend out of your wallet, you pick certain ones of those coins to be inputs into your transaction. And the strategy that you use, the algorithm for picking those coins is called coin selection. And the way you do that, which strategy you use, has a big impact on, um, on the fees you pay, on whether you end up with very small outputs as change, dusty, uneconomical change outputs um, also impacts your privacy. So that that is a, a scaling technology. Fee estimation, you could argue, is a scaling technology because a lot of wallets don't have good fee estimation and they overpay fees. So even if you have a transaction which is not urgent, you're paying a large fee, which is bad for you, but it's also bad for the network because you're bidding up the cost of everyone else getting into a block if you're paying an inappropriate fee. Um, there's probably more right now, and there's a really good wiki page from David Harding kind of documenting and laying out all of those scaling technologies that we can use right now. But coming along, we'll have Schnorr, and Schnorr is a great scaling technology, and it's a great privacy and fungibility technology. Um, it's good for scaling because, well, first of all, a Schnorr signature encoded with the encoding that Peter Wooler has proposed in a recent bit is 64 bytes. 
an ECDSA signature encoded with DER is 73 or 72 or 71 bytes. It's, it's a variable size. Now that's that's not a that's not a property of Schnorr versus ECDSA. It's a property of the encoding that we're using for those um, different signature types. And the DER encoding, which is what Satoshi chose back in 2009 or 2008 um, when he was using OpenSSL, is just needlessly inefficient in terms of size. So just that, you get slightly smaller signatures. That's good. Um, another really nice thing about Schnorr is that the equation for validating a Schnorr signature is linear, which means if you have two signatures over the same message from two different pub keys, if you add those signatures together, modulo the size of the group, that's the same as adding those two public keys together and signing with that using that pub key. So um, you can do multi-sig where it's just a single signature um, for an N of N signature scheme. And with a bit of setup off-chain, you can do a K of N multi-sig doing a threshold signature. So that makes multi-sig look just like a single signature. And currently in Bitcoin, if you want multi-sig, if you want, say, a three or five multi-sig, the spend needs to have three different signatures on, and that's really big. If you want a three or five multi-sig with Schnorr, it's just a single signature. So that's really good for scale because your transactions are smaller. It's also really good for fungibility and privacy because your transaction just looks like any other transaction. Um, if we take that a bit further and we add in Taproot, and that's another technology that's being proposed and might be part of the next soft fork, um, Taproot is a system where you can have any arbitrarily complex script as a spending condition for your transaction. But in the best case, if all of those conditions are met and everyone agrees those conditions are met, you can fall back to just having a multi-sig and that covers the spend. Um, so in the best case or in the majority case, say 99% of the time where everyone agrees, they just do a multi-sig and it just looks like any other transaction. And all of that complexity of the, the conditions of spend are hidden and never hit the blockchain. So again, that's really good for scale because you're just, you just have one single signature check. It's really good for privacy because no one sees what your conditions of spend were. And it's really good for fungibility because everything looks the same. So those are the, you know, th those are just two really nice benefits of Schnorr. Um, looking forward even further um, with Schnorr, we would have the potential to aggregate signatures across multiple inputs to a transaction. So say you have five coins in your wallet and you put them all into a single transaction for a payment out, instead of having a signature for each of those five inputs, you could have an aggregate signature across all of those. So you just have one signature for the transaction. Now that's, that's a bit more complex to do. Um, it requires kind of a change in the model of the way that we validate transactions. So that's not being proposed for the initial soft fork. I mean, we don't have a proposal for the initial soft fork, but that won't be part of that initial soft fork. That will be something down the line. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of things coming along which would make layer one just a lot more efficient. And then that kind of propagates up to layer two, because if your layer one is more efficient, then, for example, with Lightning, you can fit more channel opens and closes into each block. So a, a well, a well running, clean running layer one is really good for layer two. It kind of um, you get this um, effect where your layer one is more efficient and layer two is much more efficient, right? It kind of multiplies up. So all of these things coming together, we'll see much better scalability in the next few years, I expect. So the, it sounds like the biggest thing that's coming to the on-chain, the first layer, layer one, is going to be Schnorr because the, yes. the amount of benefits that we get from that for um, both the privacy front and the scaling front is just too enormous to ignore. So I, personally, I think that's going to be really the next thing. And now whether that goes in with Taproot and Graphroot like at the same time or before it or separate somehow, but uh, I, it's going to it's going to get in there somehow. And and again, w when you start combining these things, guys, it's all about these these crypto graphic primitives, right? Combining these little things, these building blocks to build amazing things. And that's uh, the, the, the Schnorr represents yet another building block in Bitcoin that the developers can use to create uh, even uh, more robust, more private, more, you know, uh, better scaling software. And, and again, even more complex software, like we can just, we can just keep adding complexities because again, Schnorr allows for uh, 
a relatively simple idea allows for so much more complexity. As as uh, as uh, John just said, you know, we're talking we can we can aggregate thousands of signatures possibly in the future uh, in, into a single signature, and this is just mind blowing when, when when we look at how Bitcoin works today. And so th that's great. So the on on trail uh, the on chain uh, on chain stuff, the on chain scaling stuff is coming. Uh, lots of uh, lots of word salad in here, guys. We're trying to keep it relatively uh, relatively down to earth, relatively explained. And John does just a great great job of explaining these things to me and I, this is how i understand them guys i listen to developers i'm i am a, a developer but i'm a c-sharp developer guys i don't work on the actual bitcoin protocol these guys do and this is uh where i get my information from is from the developers from the from the horse's mouth and this is just amazing amazing stuff so very very cool john um so before we close it i wanted i got a couple more questions for you so Sure. Yep. That was that was great for the on-chain stuff. Now let's get into a little bit of lightning, and after that, I just want to maybe ask what 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 are the some of the more the most important things that are coming in zero point one seven, and then I think we can close it out. So uh, <laughs> let's 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 first talk about lightning. So as we discussed, lightning really is sort of the hail mary. This is the uh, the, the the where we get the orders of magnitude. Of, of of scaling with Bitcoin, the the things that everybody was promised, right? The microtransactions, the the uh, the merchants, all all of that good stuff that uh, Roger uh, pr promised a little bit too early from uh, not understanding the protocol and how software development works, specifically open source software development. So, um, let, let's ask you, John. So, can you, maybe you can tell us a couple of some of the some of the uh, the new technologies or the new features, uh, some of the new hotness, maybe as it were, that people are working on within Lightning right now. Because again, Lightning isn't an, an additional protocol, so it is a whole separate protocol. Not separate, but it is an additional protocol that that rides on top of Bitcoin and has its own all sorts of its own properties. And it really, you guys can go down the rabbit hole with just Lightning. Uh, so, so let me ask you, uh, John, what are some of the some of the some of the main things that people are working on within Lightning right now? And maybe some, what are some of the things we can expect down the future? Okay. Well, I am not a Lightning developer. Right. Um, I'm I'm not that close to day-to-day -day changes developments in in the Lightning protocol, um, but I can give it a shot. I I'm really excited about Lightning personally. It's something that's that I've been interested in for um, many years, and I'm really excited to see it maturing and really excited to see applications being built on top of it. So things like Satoshi's Place and Yours and all the stuff that Alex Bosworth is doing. I just find fascinating and I'm, I, I want to see more of that. Um, so right now I'm going to plug um, that Chaincode Labs is hosting a Lightning Applications workshop. Um, that's in October. It's one week and we're going to have experts in Lightning application development coming and talking and our residents are going to spend that week building really cool applications and then presenting them on the Friday. So we're looking for developers who um, you know, don't necessarily know the ins and outs of the Bitcoin protocol or the Lightning protocol, but are really good at writing awesome applications and want to be able to plug those applications into a platform that allows micropayments and, and Lightning is that platform. So if you're if you're a web app developer or a mobile app developer or any kind of application developer and these ideas are appealing to you, but you don't know about Lightning and just want to use it, then come to our come to our residency, build a really cool app in a week. Um, and I'll be I'll be stoked to see that. Um, go to lightningresidency.com, and that's where you can apply. Okay, that's my plug. Um, back back to Lightning, the network. Um, well, Schnorr will have a big impact on Lightning. So the, the linearity of Schnorr allows um, the individual hops of a Lightning path to be. Um, the, the secrets in those hops to change at each hop. So currently Lightning uses something called a, an HTLC, a hash time lock contract, where you're basically paying for a hash pre-image. So as as the as the Lightning payment goes down channels through a path to the recipient, um, the recipient then, if, let me see if I get this right, the recipient reveals a pre-image and that unlocks the payment back along the path. Or maybe I got it the wrong way around, but that, that pre-image along the path is constant. And so if you have multiple, if you have a Sybil that has multiple hops on that path, they can correlate together those payments, which they shouldn't be able to do. And they could either cut out the intermediaries from that path or just de-anonymize the, the path through that network. Um, Schnorr would allow that to, um, that secret to change as it goes along so that that kind of de-anonymization or correlation attack is no longer possible. 
another change that could come with a soft fork is um, SIG hash, no input, which would make monitoring the chain for transmissions or broadcasts of old state from a lightning channel a lot easier. Um, and that, that that's written up quite nicely in a paper called L2 by Christian Decker. So that, that's cool stuff that requires a soft fork. Um, in fact, that first one I talked about, the Schnorr stuff, you could actually do it with today with ECDSA. It's just a lot more complex. And I think that um, Connor at LND has kind of implemented that with ECDSA, but it's it, it, it requires some kind of crazy cryptographic stuff. Um, more down to earth, I think the idea of like just channel management, channel balance management, splicing in new payments and splicing out payments, that'll be really helpful. Um, just in terms of management of your connections into the Lightning Network, and I think that will come along. I don't know. I don't know if people are working on that currently or will work on it. But the well, idea the, of being able things like uh, well, things like AMP might be oh, a yeah. little bit uh, might be having to do with a little bit chan channel management because again, that that's allowing you to send channel uh, uh, payments uh, uh, through multiple channels, right? So a single uh, it allows you to split up a single payment through multiple channels. And that can be really important because right now, if you have, you know, uh, uh, one Bitcoin and the payment is, uh, you want to send two payments of 0 .0, 0, uh, 0.5 Bitcoin, right? <laughs> You'd have to have, create two channels. Uh, in, in, in it's two separate channels. In, in, but with AMP, I believe that you can send uh, that one payment, uh, uh, that use your one Bitcoin to pay those 0 0.5 payments separately. Is that correct? Um, so AMP is atomic multi-path or yeah. something like that. So uh, imagine I want to pay you one Bitcoin and I have two channels out onto the Lightning Network and I have 0.5 Bitcoin liquidity in channel one and 0.5 liquidity in channel two. Well, I, I can't send you one Bitcoin as a single payment because I don't have a path to you where there's one Bitcoin of liquidity. I said it backwards. I said, said it backwards. backwards. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you got it correct. Uh, sorry, guys, a little bit early in the morning for me. Sorry, go, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit later here in the day on the East Coast, so I've, I've got an advantage over you. But um, instead of having to pay you with a single one Bitcoin payment, I can split that up and send half down one channel and half down the other channel in such a way that those two separate payments, either they both go through or they don't go through at all. That's why it's atomic. And, and the worst possible case would be, you know, I, I, I managed to pay you half a Bitcoin, but don't manage to pay you the other half. That Like, you're not happy, I'm not happy. Um, that's not possible with atomic multipath because it's atomic, right? So either you get your payment in in toto or, or, or not at all. So um, th that's cool that I think that went in maybe three months ago or six months ago. I'm not sure exactly. The, the that's that's that. relatively, it's relatively, um old in Bitcoin years, which is just like a few <laughs> months ago. <laughs> yeah, very long in the two. But yeah, it, it, the, the really nice thing about Lightning um, or layer two solutions in general is that because it's layer two, it's not a consensus protocol. So protocol development can go at a much more rapid pace, right? If you want to make a change to Bitcoin, the protocol, or the last change we had with SegWit, the next one will probably be, sh be Schnorr, and those are spread out over several years because you need to get everyone on board. It's a consensus protocol. But with Lightning, because it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, it's like a point-to-point -point protocol. Um, if you want to change the protocol, the only people that need to agree is the two people on the, the ends of those of that protocol. So um, things like L2, well, maybe not L2 because that requires a change in, in Bitcoin, but you know things like AMP and other changes to the protocol can go in a lot more quickly, and that's that's one reason why layer two is a lot more exciting um, or, or very exciting. So Lightning is is currently the best um, layer two technology that we have. That's not to say it will be the only layer two technology we have forever. Um, the, I, I think from a wider angle, layer two, layer two is a solution. Right? It's yet to be seen whether Lightning fulfills all of its promises, but it will be some kind of layer two that we use to scale up to the next order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude.
And again, this is just how uh, network stacks are built. They're built in layers because we need different layers to do different things. We cannot do everything on one layer. You know, people don't even understand that, you know, even something like Ethernet. I mean, just that is just many, many layers going all the way down to the actual physical cable. So uh, this is just how network stacks are built. They're built in layers. We don't put everything through one single pipe. Uh, we definitely break that up. Uh, and for even if something as simple as management, like you say, uh, it takes years to get stuff into the base chain, the base protocol. But with Lightning, you know, you just you can test that on live net with just one other channel, with one other person on the end of the channel. So it, it becomes just a lot easier to develop, a lot easier to to as you go up the stack. And again, I'm a C sharp developer, so I'm like way up the stack, right? I'm an application developer, so uh, when I want to send an email, you know, it's pretty much SMTP, you know, dot e dot send, you know, for me. Uh, and so in the in the in the C sharp language, and so this is uh, this allows application developers like myself to be able to work easier and work more. Uh, I just have more features available to us to be able to, to easier uh, work easier with uh, the protocol itself. So very, very cool, John. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, just before we close out, maybe just give us a couple quick, just quickly, maybe give us a couple of things that you're looking forward to in 0 0.17 uh, that has just been branched, and then we can close it out. Yeah, I actually did a talk at London Bitcoin Devs on 0 0.17 um, last Thursday, and the video for that's just gone up. And just five minutes ago, I see Brian Bishop has <laughs> written a transcript for that video. Uh, he's got very fast fingers. So um, if you want the full uncut version of what's coming up in 0 0.17, look for that video or that transcript. Um, yep, and I and I retweeted that, so you guys can definitely uh, check that out in my Twitter stream. Cool. Um, there's a lot of changes in the wallet. That's probably where um, we saw the most development in 0 0.17. So things like branch and bound, that's a new coin selection algorithm that was originally proposed in a master's thesis from Mark Eckhart at, um, at BitGo. He's currently at BitGo. That got into Bitcoin Core in 0 0.17, so that's nice, but much better coin selection. Um, more enhancements to multi-wallet in, in the Bitcoin Core wallet, so it makes it easier to have multiple wallets running on the same node. What else do we have? The, the first example of output descriptors, so output descriptors is a new way of describing the scripts that you own, kind of the, the receiving scripts that your wallet is looking out for. Um, that was proposed by Peter Wooler probably three months ago in part of a, a grand kind of reimagining of what the Bitcoin Core wallet should look like. And um, we're seeing the first kind of changes in that direction using output descriptors. I won't go into it in much more detail, but if you look for output descriptors, um, Peter Waller has a gist that describes that, and that's that's the direction that the wallet will probably be going in over the next couple of releases. We also have partially signed Bitcoin transactions, which is a new protocol, really, or a new encoding for wallets to speak to each other. So if I have a transaction that requires a signature from me and requires a signature from you, I could sign it and then have a, an encoded partially signed Bitcoin transaction, which I then hand off to you. You can complete the signature and then broadcast it. Until now, there hasn't been this common standard for wallets to speak to each other with these partially signed Bitcoin transactions. We now have that, it's Bit174, and it was implemented in Bitcoin Core by Andrew Chow. Um, and th that's a really big one too, because I mean, that also allows for privacy. Like you can, w w that that's what allowed, um, you know, um, Rodolfo's, from uh, Rodolfo's cold card wallet, right? Because he wanted to be able to sign a transaction and the, on a file and then push that file to a wallet separately. And so now this is this 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 creates a way for that to happen. So that's I think that's really cool because it could help with privacy because now you can sign transactions, right? And then broadcast them separately. You don't have to like sign it and then broadcast it. You can actually sign it. And then if you need to sign it with other devices, you can do that and then broadcast it just, just completely like anonymously through Tor or whatever you want. Yeah, well, I mean, you'd always be able to do that if you had a fully signed transaction, right? Because fully signed transaction is just ready to go on the network. Correct, yeah. I, I, I guess I meant the multiple devices now. Now you can actually, yes. from you can you can use your actual devices now. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's really nice. So if you have, for example, you know, your private keys on a, a ledger wallet and other private keys on a Trezor wallet, and you want to have multi-sig between them and you need to sign it on one and then pass it to the other, this would be a way of doing it. I, I don't think those hardware wallets yet support this standard, but um, if they if they do and other wallets do, then it, it will be a really good standard to allow things like that. I, I think just the cold card 
wallet right okay. now. <laughs> okay. Well, they're, they're ahead of the game then. Uh, Bit174 is, is pretty new. So, you know, hopefully we'll see adoption by all of the wallets, um, software wallet and hardware wallet uh, makers. Trying to think of what else good is in the wallet. Um, well, the, we, 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 we kind of named a few things there. I think we can close it out. Like that's that's awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. great. Uh, that was some of the cool things. And again, my favorite thing is still the the partially signed uh, BIP one seventy four. I think that's just really awesome. Uh, you could do some really interesting security privacy things with that uh, in, within your company to be able to help you. So definitely check that out, guys. If you are you know if you have a business in this industry. So I just want to say th uh, thanks again, John. Thank you so much for for joining us. We went a little bit longer actually than I wanted to go. I'm probably going to be late for tone vases uh talk now so that sucks but i just really I'm really sorry. i had no, i just i just I like the sound of my own, own voice too much. i couldn't stop listening john you <laughs> have so much information and again you just have the ability to articulate this really well because you are so well versed in this day to day day in and day out so we, we really thank you for your explanations we hope to have you on again uh on this channel for sure for definitely maybe on the bitcoin news show we, we got to get you at least on there and so uh we really thank you again so john please uh, if you could just tell everybody where can we find out more information about you okay i'm on twitter jf newberry that's jf n-e-w-b-e-r-y um, and from there you can probably find everything else i'm on github um, optech is on twitter chain code is on twitter you'll you'll find it all from there and of course, guys, we have the those links in the show notes below. So definitely check that out. Uh, th he's got again, the guys. They got the newsletter. They got the workshop. They got all of this information. Really, really highly check it out. This is what I read every single week. Absolutely, without without a doubt. I mean, with within five minutes of that thing popping up on my Twitter sphere, that thing is retweeted and read. So everybody needs to check it out. And we just thank you guys again. Thank big. Thank Bitcoin Optech for coming on here. Thank you guys for forming that. Thank you for all the great work that you and David Harding do. Um, we, we just really, really appreciate it, John. Uh, Thank and you. And <laughs> sorry, I, I should say, if you want, if you want to subscribe to that newsletter, it's bit bitcoinops.org, bitcoinops.org, and on that front page, you'll see a, a place where you can sign up to receive that newsletter. Yep. And of course, we have that link on the footer of our site, CryptoCast.network, because we believe that is a, an invaluable resource. So you can always find it there as well, guys. So, so again, thanks again, John. Thanks, everybody in the chat. Thanks, everybody in the comments. We really been, we've been love hearing from you guys. The new channel has been growing greatly. We just really appreciate it. We're almost at a thousand subscribers now. So please uh, like, share, subscribe this video if you found it useful, if you, if you guys learned something. And please uh, give us a rating on iTunes if you are an audio listener. And uh, we're going to try to do more of these shows, uh, you know, more of this particular show perspective again we have we actually have another episode of perspective airing today still at 8 p.m pacific so definitely check that out guys tonight we will be back already we're trying to put out as much content as possible so uh this is an effort towards that and uh, until next time guys just keep talking bitcoin and we'll see you later Bye bye